Hello my dear friends and welcome back to another Star Wars news update. So today we have a range of news. We're going to be talking about the Mandalorian universe, Boba Fett, and then, unfortunately, we do have some pretty bad news for the Acolyte. But let's kick things off with some positives. We already suspected this, but it's now been confirmed. Dave Filoni is co-writing The Mandalorian and Grogu alongside Jon Favreau. I love the way this has been worded. George Lucas' protégé confirmed as co-writer on the next Star Wars movie. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Filoni is also going to serve as one of the film's executive producers. And fans are wondering one thing. If it's Dave Filoni working on another Mandoverse project, is he going to find some way to slip Ahsoka into it? I really doubt it. They're holding off on the Peridia storyline until the second season of that show. Not the Mandalorian and Grogu movie, but I could be wrong. In the same interview, Dave Filoni spoke on the subject of artificial intelligence, AI, being used in content and media, and he says this, We must strive to teach kids that their creativity and imagination drive this new technology, and there are no shortcuts to acquiring true knowledge and experience. Basically, using it as a tool, not a substitution. Now, it's interesting he says this because, generally, I agree with the sentiment, but this is kind of contradictory to what Disney is doing. Staying in the Mandoverse, my dear friends, we now move on to Boba Fett. Another major update, this time concerning Tamara Morrison. Today, we need to clarify and debunk a few statements that I've been making the rounds a couple of days ago. I posted a video where we spoke about comments made by Tamara Morrison at Fan Expo in Chicago, and there wasn't any footage to go along with it, so we couldn't verify the truth. Basically, what was said was this. Tamara Morrison spoke about if he was going to be in the Mandalorian and Grogu movie, and apparently he flat out said no. He'd not been contacted by Disney or Lucasfilm. Well, apparently, my dear friends, this was not true. It was conflated, misconstrued, and badly reported. So, it's time to make things right. The amazing folks and good friends of this channel, Boba Fett Fan Club, decided to do some investigating. They asked various fans in attendance, and we have something of a clearer picture. Good news for Boba Fett fans. It turns out, Tomara Morrison did not say that he's not going to be in the movie, and instead, he acted very coy. What he was referring to when he said he'd not been approached was for Book of Boba Fett Season 2, which comes as no surprise. So let's take a look at what was said. Fact check. Thanks to some investigating by our friends at Boba Fett Fan Club, it appears Tamara Morrison was misquoted during a recent panel appearance at Fan Expo in Chicago. Here's what we know. When questioned about the Mandalorian and Grogu movie, he played coy and declined to comment if he was involved. This is extremely different to saying, no, I've not been approached. And apparently, my dear friends, he did mention he was originally set to appear in The Mandalorian's fourth season before it was then redeveloped as a Jon Favreau movie. This is massive and the opposite of what was reported the other day, because from this, we can infer that he probably is going to be in the movie. If he was originally in the script for The Mandalorian season four, which was then changed to The Mandalorian and Grogu, then there's a very good chance they kept in the Boba Fett scenes. And remember guys, there were reports Tomorrow Morrison was filming for something very secret. He cancelled a bunch of convention appearances. And then Tomorrow Morrison says he's still waiting on the call regarding season two of Book of Boba Fett, but not that he hasn't been approached for the Mandalorian and Grogu movie. So forget what was said the other day, we were all kind of duped by some really bad journalism and they made it sound convincing because we didn't have any video footage to show us what Tamara Morrison truly said. Based on previous track records, we all just went along with it. But I guess the lowdown is this. Great news. It sounds like there's a good solid chance Boba Fett will be back. And so now, some pretty insane news for the Acolyte. The situation for the Acolyte after its cancellation just got worse. Over the last 24 hours, there have been some very fascinating developments and fans are now speculating we might have another Willow situation on our hands, where Disney removes it from the streaming platform. I don't know if they'll go that far with it, so that does seem a bit far-fetched, but what has happened is pretty remarkable. It seems like all merchandise for the Acolyte has been removed from the Disney online store. There are a couple of items that were listed as coming soon, including a t-shirt and some Funkos, and as far as I know, the Funkos and the Hasbro figures are still set to release in other places that have already pre-ordered them, unless this changes. 
but for the meantime, when it comes to Disney's online store, all of them have been removed. Now this is really, really important, because this tells us flat out, Disney and Lucasfilm are doing damage control, almost trying to remove anything associated with the series. And for those of you who are saying, no, it's just because everything's sold out, that's not true. Go to any item that's sold out on the Disney store and you'll see underneath it, it's literally written, either new stock coming soon, but mostly it's explicitly written, sold out. So in this instance, upcoming merch for the Acolyte is no longer going to be released. And speculation is already emerging, they're going to remove the show from Disney+. Plus. For those who will manage to find some of the toys released for this show, they're going to be pretty valuable and limited edition. But it's an unprecedented development that Disney is trying to make people forget about the show's existence. Are they embarrassed by it? Because even as recent as a week ago, outlets were saying, well, the Acolyte didn't perform well, but we might still see a second season. And the second development is that Star Wars Insider issue number 227, which was Acolyte themed, coincidentally released a day after the show was cancelled. Now this was pre-planned months and months in advance, they couldn't stop it, they weren't going to pull it from releasing, but it's just bad timing. But who would have thought it? The Acolyte's merch is being pulled. Now as you guys know, the cancellation of the Acolyte, which was massive news a couple of days ago, has brought up even more questions. And one of them that came from Decider.com is worth discussing. The Acolyte's cancellation begs the question, what do audiences even want out of a Star Wars show? The answer from my perspective is pretty simple. Good writing, a good story, and staying true to the spirit of George Lucas. The issue with this answer is that all of the things I just mentioned is subjective, because there are fans who love the Acolyte and say it checked all the boxes on that list. But amongst the most popular responses to this Decider article is longer episodes. But in spite of this, Decider seems to think no matter what Disney does with the brand, they will never please Star Wars fans. Here's what they said. The Acolyte had its narrative issues, but it was also a creative breath of fresh air for the Star Wars galaxy. I disagree, but let's hear them out. At its heart, the Acolyte asks the question, who exactly gets to wield the power in the Star Wars universe? The Acolytes divided critics and fans alike. Some camps enjoyed the shades of moral grey that the Acolytes applied to the Jedi, the Sith, and overall universe, while others loathed it. Indeed, if there was one pervasive trend in the Disney Star Wars era, it's how divided the fandom feels. They say, I often wonder what exactly people want out of a Star Wars show. Do we want non-stop Baby Yoda and his buddy the Mandalorian? nostalgic fan service like the retcon heavy Obi-Wan Kenobi, spin-offs about popular side characters like the Book of Boba Fett, live-action versions of the beloved animated series, a nuanced and brilliant piece of art made by and for adults like Andor, whatever skeleton crew is going to be, all of the above or none of the above. So here's the thing, there are so many misconceptions this article has wrapped itself up in. Star Wars can have a plethora of themes and genres, it can have tons of fan service or none of it, but don't conflate those individual things with what makes a show good. It's very simply, and always has been, the quality of the story and the characters. It doesn't always have to be the classic hero's journey, and the problem with the Acolytes wasn't that they were glorifying the bad guys. Recent shows lack the depth, they don't make these characters interesting enough for us to be invested, and as a result the story suffers, the writing often feels very shallow, and even at times in these 20, 25, 30 minute episodes, sometimes they feel padded out, and on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes they're rushed. It isn't about do Star Wars fans want more Grogu, more Mandalorian, or more prequel stuff, it all comes down to the writing and directing quality. It's easy to say this without giving examples, so I'm going to give you an instance that seems very banal, very mundane, but it just shows you a small glimpse of the kind of things I'm talking about. It's the small differences. So let's take my favourite show, Andor Season 1. I'm sure Season 2 is going to be great, but so far, it's the first season of Andor that is the best written. For a moment, my dear friends, forget Cassian, forget Luthen, forget Mon Mothma and Marva, forget the main characters. Let's take a look at two side characters who stand out even though they didn't have as much screen time as the rest. Vels Arthur and Sinta Kaz. Their relationship, despite only being on screen very briefly four or five times, has so much complexity, ambiguity, and layers to it. There wasn't much exposition, but the way the dialogue was written told you everything you needed to know about their relationship and the kinds of characters they are, 
and why they matter to a story that is so focused on sacrifice made by individuals against a large imperial dictatorship regime. Think of Sinta, deeply committed to the rebel cause, driven by personal trauma, the loss of her parents, at the hands of the Empire, an intense, single-mindedness that made her such a formidable fighter. But she was also in love, and she had to make those tough choices. How much does she give to her own relationship, and how much does she give to the cause? She prioritizes the mission above even her own personal relationship, and it highlights the cost, on a human level, of what it took to start the rebellion. Vel, on the other hand, portrayed as a leader that is torn between her responsibilities and her love from a more privileged background, being in Monothma's family, but choosing to fight for the rebellion showcasing tension between her past life and current commitment. Vel's struggle with the harsh realities of the rebellion, especially when it concerns conflicts with her own feelings, adds to that complexity. And we got all of that, all of the dilemmas these two amazing characters face, from such brief bits of dialogue. That's good writing. Now I understand that the characters of the Acolyte are in a very different predicament, period of the timeline, but I gave this example to show that I just didn't feel any of the same amount of investment for characters in the Acolyte, primarily due to how much the show flip-flopped plot points and character motivations it set up itself, always contradicting itself. Character inconsistencies were too great to overlook. The most famous example is May's motivation flipping way too fast. It's like the show wanted to give us her trauma, but didn't really go far enough with it to make us so invested. She went from wanting to kill the Jedi, and truly committed to that cause, to wanting to turn herself into the Jedi, and changing her mind. The show gaslit us into thinking the witches were the victims, and aside from Sol and Indara, the acting was nowhere near as strong as something like The Andor Show. If the same effort that Tony Gilroy, Bo Willimon, and the other creatives on Andor was given to some of the other shows, I think we would be in a very different situation. What do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, check me out on socials, and may the force be with you, always.